Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our devotion this Friday morning. We trust that you are well wherever you are, wherever you may be listening, or whenever you may be listening to this. We are in the third part of this very short series looking at the post-resurrection appearances of our Lord and this particular account in John 20, verse 19 to 23 of Jesus meeting with Thomas in the upper room. And we've been looking at the whole question of doubt, saying that doubt is part and parcel of our lives and that we need to understand that it's not a lack of faith that we doubt. Sometimes we just have doubts because we are wrestling with some of the deeper things of God. Uh, we come to that remarkable statement in this passage that is probably the most remarkable statement recorded in the Gospels. Uh, it could probably be equated with the revelation to Peter when Jesus asked him who he was and he replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. One thing is for sure, the statement is about as far removed from doubt and skepticism as you can get because Thomas responds, my Lord and my God. My Lord would have placed Thomas on the same level of belief as the other disciples, that of knowing that Jesus was alive. But the addition of, and my God, moves Thomas beyond the realm of the mere human relationship of a disciple with his rabbi into a new one whereby he comes face to face with the presence of his God. This confession of Thomas really echoes chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 14 together. In the beginning, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. We have seen in John's Gospel the many titles that have been used of Jesus, the Lamb of God, the Son of God, uh, Rabbi, Messiah, the King of Israel, the Son of Man, all of these in chapter 1. And now, at the back end of John, the climax is reached with this proclamation by Thomas, my Lord and my God. And we have come full circle from John 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. But John has introduced his readers to who Jesus was to John twenty twenty eight, where the last of the disciples has come to the full realization of who Jesus was. So this is why Thomas's confession has been called the crown of John's gospel. When Jesus had predicted in John 8.28 that it came to pass, that it now come to pass, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. By being lifted up in crucifixion, which of course led in turn to death, resurrection and exaltation with the Father, Jesus has revealed his true identity as both Lord, Curios, and God. And that is why this, this confession of Thomas is just quite remarkable. It's most likely that Thomas did not place his hands in Jesus' side or hands. In a paradoxical way, he had come to discover through seeing that seeing was not believing. And in this way, John Marsh the author that I've been referring to every now and again, writes this, Thomas becomes the link, as it were, between the first apostolic belief and, and in the confession of Jesus as the Son of God and the believer of every age who makes the same confession of faith. As John has tried to convey so many times before, belief is not dependent on sight, not on touch. It is not the response to physical evidence, but it's the response of faith, which is the work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus' response to Thomas in verse 29 makes this plain. In other words, the story of Thomas stands for all ages as the link between the experience of the other disciples and the church. When Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen me, and yet they believe. It was no advantage to the disciples of having seen Jesus. 
because physically seeing can be as easily questioned as any other experience of sense. Even though they had seen, Thomas had not believed them. Perhaps that is why Paul says in Romans 10, 17, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. R. Brown offers a wonderful illustration of what Jesus' words in verse 29 mean when he says that we are blessed if we haven't seen and yet we believe. He writes this and I quote, Throughout the Gospel, and more particularly in the Upper Room Discourse, and what the Evangelist has been describing on the stage of early 1st century Palestine, he has had in mind an audience seated in the darkened theatre of the future, silently viewing what Jesus was saying and doing. True to the limitations and logic of the stage drama imposed by the Gospel form, the Joannean Jesus could address that audience only indirectly through the disciples who shared the stage and gave voice to sentiments and reactions that were shared by the audience as well. But now as the curtain is about to fall in the stage drama, the lights in the theatre are suddenly turned on. Jesus shifts his attention from the disciples on the stage to the audience that has become visible and makes clear that his ultimate concern is for them. Those who have come to believe in him through the word of his disciples. End quote. Now that attention has been shifted to the readers of the gospel. And so John goes on to indicate in chapter 20 verse 30 to 31 his purpose for writing the gospel. And this too ultimately has in view those who have not seen and yet will believe. And so John concludes with the words we have referred to continually throughout our study of John. He said he has not given an exhaustive account of all the signs Jesus did, but only selected those that support his purpose in writing his gospel. And that purpose, as we've mentioned before from verse 31, he writes, These things are written in order that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Karl Heim, a great German scholar, suggests a reason why John omits so many of the other signs, many of which we read about in the other Gospels. He says that disciples will always collect everything they possibly can about a dead prophet. That is all they have to remember him, his work and his deeds. With a living person, it's different. Then disciples say only what is necessary to introduce him to others. For John, Jesus was still living. So he only says what is necessary to introduce him. John's purpose highlights for me two very important truths. And we're going to close with this. One, it's not enough to simply believe. It matters what we believe. And secondly, faith in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God, never leaves us where we are. It leads us to life in his name. My prayer is that we will experience that life that is offered in his name. My prayer is that we will put our doubts aside. And like Thomas, we will come to that grand declaration and confession that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is is God. And we know today that we believe that. But when Thomas made those, those that claim, it was probably one of the most incredible claims that anyone could ever make, my Lord and my God. And so may God bless us as we continue to, to study his word and to understand this whole concept 
that seeing isn't, in fact, believing. So let's bow in a moment of prayer as we close off this devotion and close off this short series. Lord, we just thank you that we are blessed because even though we haven't seen, we believe. Thank you for Thomas's confession, my Lord and my God. We thank you that that truly was a full circle from the words that John uttered in John 1 verse 1 to the end of his gospel, where Thomas makes the declaration that we all ought to make, where we declare Jesus to be our Lord and our God. And so we just thank you, Lord, for the study. We thank you, Lord, for some of the insights we've gained through your word, especially on this whole area of doubt. Thank you for Thomas, Lord. Thank you for his honesty and openness, for just being who he was. Lord, help us not to be pretentious in any way. Help us to be authentic and to grapple with our doubts, not to try and hide them away for fear of people thinking that we don't have enough faith, but rather to engage in those doubts through faith. So bless us as we go into this day, and Lord, continue to teach us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great weekend. We'll catch up with you next week.